welcome all to the panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we have seen different visions for training dexterous manipulation today. Um, and so I would like to start the panel with the question, if the answer is imitation learning with scaling data, then was the role of RL in training robot policies for human-like skills? Uh, and I would like to start this um, discussion with Sergey and Ankur, um, because I think your approaches differ significantly here. So um, yeah, maybe Sergey, have at it. Okay, uh, I feel like I've been put on the spot. Uh, okay, I, I think it's a good question. And um, you know, the, the way that I would uh, provide Oh, is it not no, on? Going to do something? No, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, all right. So um, there is like kind of a simple answer and then a more complex explanation to explain why we're in the situation that we're in. So the simple answer is that um, a good RL algorithm should be able to do everything that an imitation learning algorithm can do and more. Uh, meaning that if you if you have a good offline algorithm that can also be used for online fine tuning, then you would just plug in all the same data, all the same architectures, and get back uh, a better solution and one that you can then fine tune with online RL. Um, the reason that these days you see a lot of really great results with imitation learning uh, is a confluence of a few different factors. One is that the RL algorithms problem is a harder problem, which means that especially when we start going to uh, larger data sets, more complex tasks, we need to work harder at developing algorithms that are stable in those regimes and uh, things like hyperparameter tuning, it becomes more difficult. But the other side of the equation is that in some ways, when we're doing the kind of robotic manipulation that we're doing today, um, the RL methods also are a little bit less necessary. Like if you're in a setup where it's very easy to teleoperate uh, a successful uh, execution of your task, then maybe just there's like kind of less pressure to figure out those stuff algorithmic problems. But that's not the case everywhere. Like you could imagine that maybe you have a problem where it's not a robotic arm under teleoperation, but it's like a swarm of a hundred quadcopters building, you know, constructing a building, right? Like for that, it's much harder to imagine a purely uh, imitation-based approach. Um, so that's kind of the, the explanation for where we're at now. And I think maybe the the way to contextualize is that for the kind of the the development curve for RL, it's still at the stage where there's like a lot of algorithmic ideas that need to be invented to make it like truly practical. There's some good good foundations and good ideas, but more work to be done. For imitation learning, it's a much more mature technology, which means that if we're looking at applications, especially complex dexterous tasks, it makes more sense to go with a more algorithmically mature uh, area. Okay, so uh, maybe Ankur, um, what's your perspective yeah, yeah. on that? I think it's a very good answer that Sergey gave. I have very similar opinions, um, except that obviously I'm working on slightly different set of problems. I think at the end of the day, I mean, Sergey gave an example of uh, building your construction and stuff, and I was going to give example of um, you know car manufacturing, um, building airplanes, um, going to Mars. <laughs> you can't get tally up data for those things. So if you're working on completely different set of pro problems where tally up is um, very costly and sometimes impossible, you're left with just an RL based approach as long as you can simulate. So um, I think BC has certainly become very powerful, but if you think hard about it, most of the systems are going to have to use RL at some point or the other for robustness. If you're looking for superhuman performance, I highlighted that uh, by citing David Silver's, um, you know, that slide, the rise of alphas. Um, I think that's that's where self-play and RL can play a huge role. Obviously, it depends on the fact that you, you can simulate it. Um, but I think there's there's still so much to be done with what we have in simulation, um, what we can simulate today. Um, so BC will still be a powerful, um, or I should say, lower bound that RL has to achieve. <laughs> but of course, RL comes with all sorts of knobs that are very hard to tune. Um, and there is still a lot of algorithmic stuff to be done on that, uh, as Sergey said as well. Um, but yeah, but BC has got to a point that you cannot ignore the results. I mean, you have to have your head deeply buried in the sand <laughs> to say that BC is not going to be any useful. Um, but I think um, BC needs RL as much as RL needs BC. Uh, so that loop will remain. So that's that's my answer. All right. Thanks a lot. Then sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can just be loud enough. Uh, one of the interesting things that we saw 
in the development of foundation models is that despite having a lot of data uh, in other domains, whether it was vision or language, uh, we saw very good performance, but that was not always translated to what you would call large scale viability as a product. And the, the amount of work needed on top of that was non-trivial uh, in, in, different, in different fields. Now, given that we have already seen that in other domains, what evidence do we have that first of all, building a foundation model is already tricky in terms of how to get the data and how to build something like that. But and even if we were able to get there in a year or so, what tells us that it would not be, uh, let's say, it would not plateau at 70 or 80% at, at some data point, and then we'll, we'll have the last mile problem yet again. And maybe this time around, let's start with Carlo uh, and, and others, please feel free to jump in. So yeah, I think like uh, along the lines of what Sergey was saying, um, RL is good at certain things. It's less good at, at others. Um, I think if I think about that, like if RL is not good to get to the eighty percent, it might be good to get to the un from the eighty to the hundred because it's been shown to be very good in the local regime, right, where you already have some some kind of uh, um, primitive behavior or like a local behavior, and then refine there around that to to get maybe to superhuman performance or at least to match human performance. So I think there is it's going to be quite important uh, to do something like that. I think RL has also been shown to be pretty good at uh, uh, robustness, for example, in the locomotion setting. And I think a lot of the failure cases as we see today is also because of this um, um, missing robustness um, in the in the failure cases. Um, so I do see like a potential for you know online exploration, online fine tuning to actually cover the uh, long tail of things that we don't experience in our data. But there seems to be a catch twenty two here. The catch-22 is RL is only applicable if you have access to a simulator. If you have access to a simulator, then why do you need the data? Because data from humans is very expensive. You can just do RL to begin with. And, and, uh, and in places where you cannot get data, what evidence do you have that the simulator is actually good enough? Yeah. Actually, I should have clarified. I didn't mention. I didn't mean like RL with a simulator because I think that's actually what we need to get from zero to eighty percent of RL. But if you want to get from eighty to hundred percent, it might be sufficient to do it in the real world. Okay. Then the question is how do you get the reward? But there are many ways to do it. Uh, you know, you can use the foundational model for vision language that you've mentioned. Maybe those will will give you some help in that direction. That's wonderful. Anyone else has a comment on that? Um, I, I think to kind of address your your question at a, at a, at a higher level um i think that so the topic of this workshop is it has to do with massive data right so perhaps one way i can interpret your question is uh if we get to like 80 percent and it seems like we're stuck at 80 percent what do we do do we go for even more massive data or do we go for something else and i think that's a it's a really difficult conundrum this is not the first field to face that conundrum and there are some very bad decisions that could be made. So if you imagine that you go back in time to when like GPT-2 first came out and you are, um, you know, maybe building some like natural language tools or something and, and you look at this thing, like, okay, that's pretty cool. Like it can generate like good stories about like unicorns in South America or whatever their demo was, but like, it's not going to like answer queries or help with search. So what will I do? Well, maybe I'll build some kind of fairly complex logical and symbolic system around it to like hook into this thing in the right way so that it can do uh, like search or something. Well, that would have been probably a mistake at that point, because if you had just waited a number of years, then you, instead of GPT-2, you'd have GPT-4, which would have much greater capabilities. And uh, perhaps a lot of the work you would have done in the meantime would have been obviated. So there's a very diff, and that's not to say that the, that's always the wrong answer. Like sometimes it is the right answer, but there's a very difficult call to be made as to when you kind of double down on the data-driven stuff versus try to like put in and place some kind of like training wheels and crutches to get it to work. And an example of a place where maybe the opposite decision has proven to be uh, at least so far very good is autonomous driving. So in autonomous driving, uh, you know, you can take a Waymo uh, for a taxi ride in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> I'm. I don't know exactly what the Waymo is running. I know some things about it, but it's certainly not running a fully end-to-end -end stack, right? So that's not to say the right answer is always one thing or the other thing, but we have to be very, very thoughtful about it. And we shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that because a particular system has a limitation, we need to build crutches to get around that limitation as opposed to developing new ideas to better use data. We also shouldn't jump to the conclusion that we should always just use more data. 
something that he measured and took it down. <laughs> Uh, maybe something um, along the lines, uh, in many fields of ML, people are talking about emergence and emergent behavior. Um, and I guess this is also what has driven the success of GPT and was the step from two to four, um, where we have seen all these emergent capabilities by just scaling the models. But we have also heard talks today in robotics that we know a lot about, about our systems and we, that we can uh, introduce these, these biases. So uh, my next question would be, do we just scale the data and wait for emergent behaviors in robotics or does it make a lot of sense to include these physical priors that we have into our models and maybe um jens you can start with that because i guess you you are the expert on that well <laughs> well i think what we have seen already is that scaling seems to do a lot of the work so i i don't know if we need to embed the physics based priors right now well carlos already showed one way to do it and it seemed to work fairly well but maybe when we hit the sort of limitation of scaling and all that it might be make a sense to look into how we can embed this and uh, physics priors but one thing that we could do already is to look into equivariance which i talked about like many of the works so far has not really thought about equivariance like symmetries and we have a lot of that in robotic data so we could do i think we could use that Ankur, you're online. Do you have any thoughts? Um, I think I'd like to go back to um, Aloha Unleashed paper. That's a, that's a good case of a um, study where they scale up things uh, by collecting 26,000 demonstrations and the success rates are still somewhere hovering around 70%, 75%. Um, so it's it's not... I mean, you can scale up more uh, by making it 26 million demonstrations of stuff if you want to do. Um, but going back to LLMs as well, we are seeing a fundamental limit to what we can do by just scaling. And sort of there are things that look like there is an emergence, but they also fail really, really badly. <laughs> I mean, there's still examples of 9.11 and 9.8 uh, comparison and LLMs still seem to be uh, bad at comparing them. Um, what I don't know is what sort of priors you might need. I think if it's like going back to physics and adding priors, um, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. And exploring simulation in that context seems like also a pretty good idea. But I think uh, I would be careful about emergence here right now. <laughs> yeah, I can comment on it. And um, actually, I can give you my experience when we were working at the Body Transformer. Um, People from computer vision would always say like inductive biases are going to bash you back. Um, and I think there is a subtle difference between different types of inductive biases, uh, because sometimes we think of end-to-end -end systems as uh, convolution neural nets or transformers. These are also um, induct strong inductive biases. The difference with the type of inductive bias that are going to bash you back is that these ones um, don't limit the representation power of your architecture. So they leave you complete freedom um, and they're still universal approximators. Um, so if the inductive bias is there to guide learning, um, then go for it. Um, if it's going to constrain your learning landscape, then it might be not a very good idea to use that. Same thing goes for priors. Um, I think like physics priors uh, can be used, for example, in simulation to generate new data. Um, they can be used, uh, for example, through videos um, uh, to, to get some initialization and be in a better initialization region uh, for your training. Um, so I think there is definitely no harm in using any of these. Um, of course, there are better inductive biases and worse inductive biases, but those that don't limit your, your learning, I think, have almost no harm. Um, you know, Ilya Sutskever has uh, had an interesting saying, which is that um, inductive bias is training data in disguise. Um, it's a statement that, I, when, when you think about it, has a lot of depth to it. Um, we, um, in the... In research, especially academic research, we have uh, we have an inductive bias of sorts, which is a bias towards uh, coming up with new methods, right? If you come up with a new method, you publish a paper, that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, when you have um, something like methods that add a structure that reflects physical properties, it you know there are many many different ways to do it, so there are many ways to to create new new methods that way. And what Ilya's uh, saying kind of uh, gets at is that. Very often, when we take methods like that 
and we increase the amount of data, the benefits become smaller and smaller. And that's what, what it means to say that inductive bias is trained data in disguise. Now, we should be very careful with that statement because, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't change architectures, for example, in various ways. But if you look at the kind of architecture and model changes that have been most effective in the past, many of them, I, they're all inductive bias because that's literally what, what a neural net architecture is. But it's not inductive bias towards putting direct kind of world knowledge into, into the system. It's inductive bias towards kind of properties of effective learning processes. So it's a very kind of meta level thing. Uh, if you look at things like batch normalization, uh, even just the structure of transformers, like all these things, they're not really building in world knowledge so much as that they're making things more learnable. Um, and I, I think there's a lesson to be, to be gained from that. The, the lesson is that we should think about inductive biases insofar as they make it easier for, for us to use data rather than supplant data so that we don't end up essentially providing training data in disguise. Want to add to that before we move on? Okay. We have sure. some questions from online. Yeah, let, let, let's yeah. get to that. Yeah, we also have some questions from online that I want to um, yeah, ask. So one question is, what is the significance of memory or context length in robot foundation models? Currently, the VLA models typically have extremely short or no memory. Who wants to? Well, it's working on VLA models. <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> and 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 I think that is very sad. Um, so there is a there is actually there's like a good reason and a bad reason for it. So um, one might think that the good reason is that long context is hard, and if you have lots of images, then you need even longer context. So there's like some systems challenges, and like you know, big companies with lots of GPUs and TPUs will surely figure out a solution. But there's actually a more subtle uh, issue, which is if you start adding history to a policy trained with imitation learning, uh, you can make your policy a lot worse. Um, why? Well, because in the physical world where things tend to be mostly smooth, the current action is strongly correlated with the previous action. And the previous action is strongly correlated with the current observation plus the previous observation. So you will easily get policies that simply copy what they were doing before and not actually perform the task properly. Um, this is something that, uh, uh, folks like uh, like Drew Becknell and his students have studied extensively. It's also something that my students uh, studied in a paper called Causal Confusion. Um, you can interpret this in lots of different ways, but roughly speaking, what it means is if you add history, the model has more ways to cheat and get a high likelihood without actually solving the task. This is really an, uh, an algorithmic problem. Like there's surely a solution that we can come up with. There's probably some clever technique and certainly there's papers proposing various techniques that can get around this. But that's actually the real reason why we don't see more policies with histories because it usually makes them worse. And by the way, that's a BC problem with RL. You can make it work. So one, ways, one way to solve it is to use RL. <laughs> Very short comment. Uh, I second what Sergey said, and uh, it's actually a big issue uh, when learning from tactile sensing or sparser data. Um, what you saw today is like um, that the policy, when you give it tactile attributes, just goes directly to the object. So it uses the knowledge uh, of the tactile attributes, but it doesn't go and poke the object uh, before uh, actually understanding whether it's the right attribute or not. And that's actually a side effect of using a short history. It's very, very important for sparse uh, sensory data, and uh, it would be nice to figure out a way to do it. Um, as Sergey said, like we haven't yet, I guess. Okay. Uh, in in the spirit of massive data, uh, and all of you have worked mm -hmm. on different sizes and different types of problems. Generally, scaling of data itself is non-trivial. Often, you have to do trade-offs between quality, diversity, and scale. Could you comment on based on your experience? especially because data collection in robotics is much more expensive per unit of data point compared to language or vision. How can we chart a path forward in that sort of trade-off space? Uh, we can start with maybe Uncle. Uncle. Yeah, so I haven't really worked on BC. Uh, so my experience is mostly through RL, which automatically creates curriculum of data generation uh, if you set the knobs properly and if there's an evaluation in the loop, as we saw with uh, what OpenAI and what we did with automatic domain randomization, um, I think this sort of approach can also be adapted for um, manipulation tasks and stuff. Um, but obviously, it requires um, 
more careful thoughts about you know how to design um, systems and um, scenes and stuff and simulations. While it's much easier to do uh, sort of diversity in in real, but I think you also hit an asymptote which you don't necessarily do if you figure that out in RL because you can always do different ways to improve the performance through self play. But in in real, there's a there's a, there's a fundamental limit you can you hit and um, an asymptote with the data collection after that. Um, it's very difficult to build uh, systems that have um, uh, superhuman performance by adding more and more and more data because the amount of effort needed to collect data to improve the performance becomes significant that it might not be uh, feasible in the real world. So my, my experience is mostly through simulations and I feel like that's one way where they, that's one place where we can still leverage uh, scaling really effectively by a combination of uh, automatic scene design through LLMs these days and, uh, and self-play. The one thing that we have done is uh, instead of collecting data from the start, is if we have some behavioral cloning or something like that, to recognize where the model weird off and did something uh, something wrong and just collect some corrective actions and data in that space. And that sense we can like put less tax on the, it's less taxing on the on the demonstrator, and we can just get high quality data in the regions where the model seems to struggle a lot, and that has worked quite well. Um, one thing that we found when we were working on the on the Pi Zero um, system is that you can actually get around that that trade off challenge, which, by the way, is very spot on. Like that is that is definitely the trade off by using a pre training and post training recipe, and we. We didn't actually model this off how LLMs are done, although we kind of, it was like convergent evolution that we end up with something. Then we look at it like, hey, that's actually worked for LLMs too, is to basically pre-train the model on diverse data. And the diverse data will necessarily be of lower quality because that's how it gets to be diverse. And then have a post-training phase where we use a much smaller amount of very carefully curated high quality data. And that actually works better than either of the two by themselves because just the low quality data will lead to low quality strategies and just the high quality data will be too narrow such that when the robot makes a mistake, it'll be an unfamiliar situation. But if you have both, it basically teaches the policy to do what the high quality data does. But if it ever gets out of the distribution that the high quality data covered, then it still has some fallback from the pre-training. And that's much more analogous to how um, LLM post-training works too. So I think that is one way to get around that trade-off and it seemed to be very effective so far actually. I should recommend. Um, okay. Yeah, I should recommend that sometimes reasoning in the uh, better in a better representation space actually can help there. Um, I think there was a very nice demo here of Coral um, showing that having a touch signal, for example, when picking a grape, um, it actually um, uh, makes like uh, retrying behaviors emerge. Uh, because imagine like uh, if you uh, go inside a shopping bag, pick up a grape. Uh, and then you take it out, um, you, you don't see it by vision. So you'll never know whether you actually grasped it or not. Uh, well, if you have like a touch sensor or something that gives you information about contact, um, then it will immediately notice that, um, that the behavior is a failure behavior and will immediately reattend. Um, so sometimes it's also a matter of representation space. So yeah, maybe we can take some questions from the audience here in the room as well. And I'll just repeat them so that Ankur can uh, hear them as well. So we have one, we have one over there. <laughs> Can you give a little bit of a question? Primarily, I've heard you in the school or the school. So, there's this hypothesis that large scale imitation learning is a very common thing for like, robotic tools. However, that obviously requires large scale teleoptica to even work on. So, my question to you is if, let's say, if you're in an academic lab or something like that, you can't go and collect like, you know, like hours of teleoptica. I mean, not like a tenth of the data that you have or a hundredth of getting more data uh, <laughs> so I, I guess the more serious answer is like we are not the first community to face this this challenge like uh you know if, if you go back to the early 2000s like the largest computer vision data sets were much much smaller than the kind of robotic data sets that we can collect in a single lab now and the computer vision community worked really hard on it uh and 
you know, their equations obviously is different from ours. Like, you know, if you can scrape data from the web, maybe it's easier, but at some level, like it takes work. And perhaps more importantly, it is work that a research community should amortize over many researchers. And we've seen examples of this, like R RTX is a big collaborative effort that involved lots and lots of labs getting together and saying like, yeah, if we like pool all of our stuff, then we're going to have a data set and it, it can get us some distance uh, further ahead. And I think we should keep doing those kinds of things. And I think that uh, we can develop good uh, kind of standards in our community for sharing data sets, reusing the same data set. Like, I think there needs to be like a little bit of pressure to like all else being equal, try to reuse the data set that already exists just to kind of incentivize that kind of work. Uh, and I think we can get there. And I think that uh, if many research labs pool their efforts, um, we can do a really good job of that. Like, you know, shortly after so my, my lab re released uh, uh, a second version of the bridge data set a few years back. And just a few months after that, we found there were like two or three other data sets that came out around the same time that were the same size or bigger. And that was, you know, arguably in the very, very infancy of this kind of robotic foundation model work. Now this stuff is much more mainstream. So I think if everybody pitches in a little bit, we'll all be fine. I think we had a question in the back. Yes. Can you make like a little bit, please? Ah. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, okay. Let, let me try, let me try to repeat that question and you can tell me if I got it right. So, uh, how do we in initialize RL algorithm with BC? It seems like many ways of doing it kind of don't either don't make sense in the case of action chunking or don't work well in the case of the negative results that you cited. So like what's up with that and how do we make it work? Is that okay? Um, uh, all right. So there's like some technical stuff about RL and some technical stuff about imitation learning. So for RL, one of the most important things to make practical RL algorithms work is to have a value function. And unfortunately, value functions don't get initialized with BC because BC trains policies and not value functions. So figuring out how to initialize value functions from data is really, really important. That's what offline RL does. And there are offline RL methods that work very well in kind of more limited settings, but they're harder to scale up than imitation learning methods. So that's like, that's the algorithm research frontier. And I think that that's a, there's some tough problems, but we can make progress along that frontier. And as we make progress there, we'll basically get better methods to initialize value functions from offline data. So that's like a fairly well-scoped problem. Uh, now, if we go to the imitation learning side of the equation, there are a bunch of things that imitation learning methods do uh, that are like a little peculiar. Action chunking is one of them. And those peculiar things are typically there to deal with one or both of the, uh, of the problems the uh, the causal confusion problem or the uh, distributional shift problem. And they're really actually the same problem at some level. Um, the reason that these things are imitation learning specific is because you actually don't need them for RL because RL gets around those problems in other ways. Um, so, uh, and in fact, there have been experiments with using action chunking for RL and the results are extremely mixed, mostly negative, uh, perhaps because it's solving a problem that exists with imitation learning but doesn't exist with RL. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. Like you can interpret that statement as, as either saying like, oh, something is wrong with RL because it doesn't benefit from this awesome thing. Or you can interpret it as uh, saying RL is better because it doesn't need this thing. Take your pick as to which of those interpretations you like. Uh, but I think that there's like an algorithmic frontier and we need to develop better algorithms. We are limiting on time. One question that is not for <laughs> much bigger all the time and at the moment we are at a, at a, at a sort of a boundary where academia cannot cannot really work well because they need these large foundation models and so this, this transformative origin were being built for language and then we add vision and then we add touch and then we might add smell or we might add whatever and so they are uh, they are really getting big and you need some from a from a commercial company at least as a basis and then you can train a different thing 
And I don't think that this really scales well. And also, I don't think that with you need 10 times as much data to get 10% improvement. Uh, that's also that won't scale well. Um, so aren't you also worried that we would need some other kind of architecture, which is more complex and more efficient? Because we cannot use nuclear power plants in, in the future to train our models, which is actually being considered. Anyone else? Well, I guess we always have had the problem with scaling, like when deep learning was out, like getting your hands on many GPUs and all that. So yeah, maybe we could look into more uh, data efficient learning and all that, but the one, the models that are out now literally run, can run on your local GPU and doesn't need a, a, a nuclear power plant, at least the robotic foundation models. I've been playing around with uh, the Crossformer for a few few weeks now and it doesn't need that much. I think it's an. I think we are obscured by the large language models, but the robotic foundation models are actually very neat and small size. Maybe a different perspective is that um, it's true we are um, moving towards a world of abundant data uh, in robotics too, and. Uh, um, it's not just about making architectures more efficient, but what you've seen in history, like in robotics in the last 10 to 20 years, maybe especially also in other fields like computer vision and NLPs, is not about making the architecture more efficient, but make them such that they can absorb this increasing amount of data. And I think there, there is a lot academia can do. Um, you can also do it at small scale and uh, show the potential uh, for scaling. Uh, and I think it's something that's gonna be very important in the future. That's a great answer. And one thing I would add is also, uh, you know, there's challenges that come with this stuff, but there's also opportunities. So um, really good pre-trained models, uh, once you have them, they can be fine-tuned with less data than if you were training from scratch. So in some ways, it can actually alleviate parts of that problem. And there have also been like really good ideas put forward to make fine-tuning of foundation models more practical on a budget, like low rank adaptation, for example. Uh, this combined with good open source models uh, you know, they, they can help a lot. Now, the challenge is still there. So if you talk to, uh, you know, NLP students that are working on language models, like, yep, they can grab like Llama. Llama is a great resource. Open source ha has uh, has uh, weights available, low rank adaptation, smaller data set, run some experiments, but there's still challenges. Like they still need a big enough GPU to, to hold this thing. So I would say the challenges are not insurmountable and there are a lot of ideas being put forward uh, to address them. And also there's new opportunities like being able to get away with smaller data sets than you would from training from scratch. So it's changing the landscape, but I wouldn't say it's changing in a way that uh, kind of puts academics out of business, so to speak. All right, so maybe in the interest of time um, and because we all uh, also want to get to lunch, um, I would once again, thank the panel uh, for the discussion. Yeah, and I uh, hope you join us as well in the afternoon session where we will continue on this topic.